Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and this week I have a news story about a missing comma that cost a company $10 million, and a meaty middle about the difference between compared to and compared with. Let's get started. People have such strong opinions about the Oxford comma that in 2013, the satire site The Onion published an article titled Four Copy Editors Killed in Ongoing AP Style Chicago Manual Gang Violence which ended lamenting an innocent bystander who committed suicide after being, quote, caught up in a long-winded dispute over the use of the serial or Oxford comma, unquote. But that little comma before the and in a series such as Red, White, and Blue is no joke for contract lawyers. Last week, news broke that the Oakhurst Dairy in the state of Maine would have to pay its milk truck drivers approximately $10 million because of a missing serial comma in Maine's overtime law. In this class action case, the two sides were arguing about the duties employees do for which they don't get overtime pay. This is the ambiguous sentence that describes the exemptions. The canning, processing, preserving, freezing, drying, marketing, storing, packing for shipment or distribution of one, agricultural produce, two, meat and fish products, and three, perishable goods. The drivers do distribute perishable goods, milk, but the important part is that there is no comma after the word shipment in the phrase packaging for shipment or distribution. Therefore, the drivers argued that the word distribution is modifying packaging and isn't a separate thing that makes them exempt. In other words, the drivers said, we don't package milk, so we aren't exempt from overtime pay. And the dairy said, wait a minute, you distribute perishable goods, so you are exempt. And all this rests on how you interpret the final part without a serial comma. Packaging for shipment or distribution of perishable goods. Complicating matters is that the main legislative drafting manual tells lawmakers not to use serial commas. An outrage, if you ask me, because as the court decision pointed out, the addition of a serial comma would have made the meaning absolutely clear. It would have clearly marked distribution as a separate activity. But instead, lawmakers left it out. The main manual actually warns lawmakers about sentences just like the one in question, where a list item is modified. It says that instead of trying to solve the problem with a comma, they should rewrite the entire sentence so they don't need one at all. But they didn't rewrite the sentence, which left the dairy and the drivers with an ambiguous sentence, worth $10 million. An earlier court ruled in favor of the dairy, But now the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit has overturned that ruling in favor of the drivers. Circuit Judge David J. Barron wrote the opinion, which is more pleasant to read than most court documents I've seen, opening, quote, For want of a comma, we have this case, unquote. There's a long section in the middle about whether the words shipment and distribution are synonyms. And then we get to a grammatical argument that each of the words that describes an exempt activity, canning, processing, preserving, and so on, are gerunds. But shipment and distribution are both nouns. Aha, said the drivers. This means shipment and distribution both serve the same function, and it's a function that is different from the gerunds, also known as the exempt activities. They argue that if distribution of perishable goods were an exempt activity, it would have been called distributing perishable goods, that they would have used the gerund. And the court agreed. Boom, $10 million. This isn't the first time a court case has hinged on a comma either. Back in 2006, a Canadian company lost a million-dollar case that came down to a comma before a modifying phrase. As the main legislative drafting manual noted, quote, Commas are probably the most misused and misunderstood punctuation marks in legal drafting, and perhaps the English language. Use them thoughtfully and sparingly, unquote. And I would add, use them with extreme caution when modifying phrases are involved and millions of dollars could be at stake. 
Thanks to the many listeners who sent me links to this story last week. It's not often that we have a hot grammar news story. Before we get to the meaty middle by Rob Rinalda about other kinds of ambiguous sentences, it's time to thank Audible, our sponsor this week. With Audible, you can get audiobooks and listen on the go to books you've been meaning to read. Because you can do two things at once, cook and enjoy a book, for example, it's like a magic system that gives you more time. I love it. I've been using Audible for more than a decade, so you know I'm a big fan. Last year, I listened to 25 audiobooks, and those were books that I wouldn't have had time to read any other way. The Audible app is free and works on iPhones, iPad, Android, and Windows phones. You can also download and listen on your Kindle Fire and more than 500 MP3 players. With Audible, you own your books, so you can access your books anytime and anywhere, right from your smartphone. Have you resolved to cook more? Well, let the sauce simmer while the plot thickens. You can't actually make more time, but you can make the most of it. Turn your chores into something more with a free trial at Audible. Go to audible.com slash gg to start now. Audible has supported the Grammar Girl podcast for years and years, so if you like this podcast, show them you appreciate it and get that free trial at audible.com slash gg. And now on to between, compared to, and compared with. Someone once said, between Springfield and St. Louis, there's only one brain surgeon. Oh, came the puzzled reply. Do you mean that if you combine all the medical professionals in those two cities, there's only one brain surgeon? Or do you mean that within the territory that one must traverse to pass from one city to the other, there's only one brain surgeon? Turns out it was the latter. There's only one brain surgeon practicing in the region between Springfield and St. Louis. As with many words that have multiple interpretations or applications, between can create confusion. Between 2003 and 2004, one might write. Guess what? There is nothing between 2003 and 2004. There's not an infinitesimal fragment of time there. It's one year or the other. If you use the between 2003 and 2004 construction, you may be trying to describe a time spanning all or part of those two years, or you may be trying to contrast one year against the other, and there are better ways to do both. For example, let's say you want to talk inclusively about 2003 and 2004. You could write in 2003 and 2004, or from 2003 through 2004. From 2003 through 2004 is still a bit nebulous, as you're not specifying when in 2003 your starting point is. From the start of 2003 through 2004 makes it clear that you mean from the beginning of 2003 through the end of 2004. If you want to contrast two years, make that clear too. In 2004, more than 3,500 bison flew out of the Buffalo airport, contrasted with 2003 when only 1,900 buffalo took wing. As an aside, because compared to and compared with constructions are so widely, almost zealously botched, spare yourself. Use liken to and contrast with, and you'll save yourself about 100 bucks a year in headache remedies. However, if you must, here's the quick and dirty tip. Compared to refers to similarities, and compare with indicates considering both similarities and differences. For example, Squiggly could compare a flying bison's takeoff to that of a Chinook helicopter. When he uses compare to, he's noting the similarity. On the other hand, Aardvark could compare a bison with a Chinook helicopter to look for clues about how a bison could fly. When he uses compare with, he's examining both things that are the same between a helicopter and a bison and things that are different. Two more notes on between. It's often used as a preposition, and when it is, use the objective case of the pronouns. Just between you and me. That's between him and her. There's a rift between them and us. We've also covered the difference between the words between and among. As a brief review, you often use between when you're referring to two individuals and entities, or among when you're referring to people or items in a larger group, 
But it's much more nuanced than that. So if you're interested, refresh your memory and look at the old article. Very often, a writer will use a range in mentioning a collection of distinct yet closely related elements. For example, contributors range from internal communicators to external communicators to public relations professionals to journalists to bloggers. Gee, that's not much of a range, is it? The quick and dirty tip on using the word ranges is this. Make sure your range really spans something. Imagine that the range is like the one in the song Home on the Range, offering a wide, expansive view of an entire landscape from end to end. Your range can span many things, time, size, the alphabet, a continuum of dress designs throughout the ages. For example, the totem poles in the display ranged from three feet to four feet tall. Her hair color over the years had ranged from platinum blonde to raven black. If you're describing a collection of things, use the words as diverse as or as varied as instead of range. His collectibles were as diverse as steam calliopes, odd-shaped persimmons, and Esperanto bartender guides. Includes also works. Contributors include internal communicators, journalists, and bloggers. Remember this, though. When you use include, don't list every contributor or whatever. Those who are included are a subset of the entirety. That segment was written by Rob Rinalda of Reagan Communications. He's word czar on Twitter, word underscore czar. And I'm Mignon Fogarty, author of Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing. Finally, I'll end this podcast with a tribute to Washington Post copy editor and all-around good man, Bill Walsh. Bill was taken from us too soon last week at the age of 55. I read his first book, Lapsing into a Comma, or Curmudgeon's Guide to the Many Things That Can Go Wrong in Print and How to Avoid Them, that came out in 2000, and I was charmed. I followed Bill's work for many years before finally meeting him a few years ago at the American Copy Editor Society meeting in Las Vegas, and it was a highlight of the weekend. Bill didn't just enforce rules. He was nuanced and also made rules. For example, in 2015, he updated the Washington Post style guide to accept the singular they, writing, quote, For many years I've been rooting for, but stopping short of employing, what is known as the singular they is the only sensible solution to English's lack of a gender-neutral third-person singular personal pronoun, unquote. But he thought the time had come and he had the power to make it so at the post, leading the way for others. And I regret that I never told him how pleased I was with that proclamation. Beyond copy editing, Bill was known for his wit. For example, he took Thumbtack.com to task for using a pushpin instead of a thumbtack for its logo. And he tweeted tips such as, Celebrities are bold-faced names. Lies are sometimes bald-faced. I'm just plain bald. And the Washington Post is hiring copy editors. For more information, use your reporting skills. Here's to Bill. And do yourself a great favor and buy one of his books. That's all. Thanks for listening.